as always, it's great to be back here. Hopefully, for hopefully we start coming once more than once a month. Um, but next week, with the Dutchers, we leave for Alabama for a vacation. So we're really excited for that. Um, I'm sure Ryan and Phil probably told you guys about the event we went to a few weeks ago in LA. Um, and so that was just such a huge blessing for us. It was just a blast. Um, just to be able to meet people that are out there every day fighting. You know, and the two people um, that we met that were huge to me was uh, Lila Rose, the founder of um, Live Action. And she's not, she's not a Christian, uh, Protestant Christian anyway. Uh, but it's something she, she started when she was 15 years old. You know, and then she, as young as she went into Planned Parenthood on the cover um, to get them on recordings and videotape them breaking the law. Um, and something that was certain her heart because when she was 11 or 13 or whatever it was, she read a book about abortion that she had in her house and it just stirred her heart. Um, and seeing 15, later, 15 years later what something that God put on 15 year old's heart to do, what it's turned into now. Um, and so it's, it was just a 15 year old person. A girl, and it's not, it's not like she was so insignificant, but just because there's a stern in her heart. Um, and Ben Shapiro, who's not a believer either, but he's out there constantly fighting for righteousness. Um, and I, I go on Twitter and I, I find so many people that are not believers but are still fighting for righteous causes. And sometimes it's bizarre to me. I was telling Phil, there's this girl on there that. Do you think she was a Satanist? The way that she looks, the way that she dresses. But she's hardcore pro-life. It is it's mind-boggling. But God will use anyone, even if they don't follow Him. Um, but the tragedy is when the people that do follow Him don't mm-hmm. do those kind of things. And there are plenty of organizations, don't get me wrong. But um, it's just a, that's just a small encouragement. That if there's something God's putting your heart, it doesn't have to be the pro-life thing that's huge in your heart. That's something that's a huge burden on my heart. Something that's a huge burden on Shelly's heart is human trafficking. Um, and so God gives us all different, you know, burdens. And don't ever suppress it. Don't ever kind of just put that away and think that you're someone insignificant that can't do something just because you're not rich, you're not famous or whatever. It doesn't matter who you are. You, you can always do something for the kingdom of God. Um, anyway, so, the title of my sermon is... Uh, Fortify your walls. Uh, we're going to be, I'm going to read a lot out of, uh, what is it, at Second Chronicles um, and out of Second Kings. Sec- so we're going to read a lot of scripture today, um, but I know no one minds that. So if you want to go ahead and open up to Second Chronicles 31, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord God, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for bringing us back here, God. You know it's just such a joy. For us, when we get to spend time with our church family, um, Lord, but we don't, uh, I don't come here, Lord, with a word from me, Lord, I come here from a word from you. Amen. God, a, a word that you have put on my heart to speak, Lord, a, a word that you want to speak to your people, Lord God. Um, so, Lord, I just pray that you get your word across the way you want, Lord, in the manner, the tone, in the exact way, Lord, that every word that comes out of my mouth will be from you, Lord God. Amen. Lord, I want to speak one thing that's not of you. Um, God, at this end of this, I pray that you just give us such a deeper desire to serve you, to draw closer to you, to honor you more, Lord God. Um, and Lord, that you be glorified in today's message. So I just pray that your uh, blessing be upon the rest of the service, Lord God. Um, and being here so often, sometimes it's enough to leave after worship. Um, but Lord, I just pray that you would just speak to your people. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right, so Second Chronicles thirty-one twenty. I'm gonna we're gonna be speaking about Hezekiah. Um, I just want to read this one verse because it it captures Hezekiah's life. It captures everything about Hezekiah, uh, and we're gonna dive into that. But I just want to start with this verse, verse twenty. Uh, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. Um, I just finished reading through the four four books. The two books in Kings, the two books in Chronicles. And Hezekiah was someone that really stood out to me. Um, there's a few in there that do. But this was a man, he was prepared for what God had him to do. He was someone that came into his reign as king, prepared for what God had him to do. 
Um, it wasn't someone that had a wake-up moment during his reign, uh, but it entered it ready to give God complete control of his nation. Uh, Josiah was one that he took, he took over at seven years old, which is kind of crazy to me, but it wasn't until they found the scrolls and explained it to him that he had a complete change of heart. Um, Hezekiah came in already with that. When you read through the when you read those books, you find three types of kings. You find ones that were horrible, that wanted nothing to do with God. Uh, they said they were drunk on their power and women and did whatever they wanted. Um, but they were the king. They were the king of their lives. They wanted to be king of everything. There were those that were pleasing in God's sight, um, but still did take down all the idol worship. Did God still call them pleasing, but they didn't take down all the idol worship. They still had compromise in their life. Um, and then those who were sold out, completely dedicated to God, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, I went and looked uh, at the amount of good kings and the amount of bad kings. And the good, I'm, I'm encapsulating the ones that thought compromised, but God thought them was pleasing. There, from Saul to Zedekiah, there are 32 bad kings. And then there was only 10 that were described as good. Um, but Hezekiah was one of those. And uh, it talks about that there's none before him like him or after him that are like him. Um, and a lot, when I, a lot of different research I was doing Hezekiah, they are saying he, he growing up, he part heard the, the prophecies of Amos and Hosea, um, that when they were pronouncing judgment, I mean, they were there before him, preaching before he took over, but they said he probably heard it. Uh, and that probably changed his heart. And there was Isaiah who was speaking to his dad. He ended up speaking to Hezekiah as well. Um, but a lot of people are figuring that's what changed heart because his dad, we'll get into his dad in a second, but um, his dad was totally different. And the three things I feel Hezekiah did that marked him with the presence of God were obedience, worship, and surrender. Um, Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, who was 180% different. Ahaz was someone who led Judah into the judgment of God. The Bible said God had to humble Judah because of Ahaz. Um, he was a complete enemy of God, even though he had Isaiah speaking to him on a regular basis. And he heard the prophecies as well. Uh, the, prof- the prophets Amos and Hosea were in his time. Um, and it was something where, when you read through Isaiah, there's a good chunk in there at the beginning of Isaiah talking about Ahaz, and later talking about Hezekiah. But Isaiah is constantly going to Ahaz saying, God wants to do this and he wants to do this. And Ahaz is like, no, I don't want to do that. And so God's constantly giving him a chance and he just keeps rejecting him. Um, and so logically you think looking at it uh, you think there's no way this guy's son is going to be someone that's pleasing to God you see the way he is like man there's no chance you know this poor kid got no chance Um, I know certainly I wouldn't be one of the people that say no this son's going to be totally different you know I would logically human logic you look at it and you're thinking oh man this kid's got no chance um but seeing that, seeing the pattern that happened between Ahaz and Hezekiah reminds me that God can use anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, when, I remember when Samuel was born, it really opened my eyes. Because we're at the hospital, and I just see all kinds of people walking in there with newborn babies. I'm like, this kid has no chance. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, ter- it's, it's so sad to see. Mm-hmm. I remember they took Samuel away uh, to circumcise him, and then they brought him back. And we were so excited that Samuel was back. And they're like, man, we're glad you guys are happy because there's other parents that are not happy when we bring their kids back. I'm like, what? And it, it makes you want to weep for those kids. You know, it makes you want to weep because I'm like, at such a young age, their parents don't want them. And you see that so often um, in society. You see parents, you're like, what are these people doing having kids? And it makes me think of um, something that really always makes me want to cry is when I, you see parents take their kids to the transgender story hour. You know, there's kids there that have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And their parents are just indoctrinating them with this wickedness. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what is going on? These kids, you're going to public school. Um, and not saying how public school is bad, but a lot of it is. Because mm-hmm. um, they're just teaching them godless things. I mean, you read more and more reports about them teaching sexual things younger and younger and younger. Mm-hmm. And crazier and crazier and crazier. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something Pastor Carter always preaches on that. These schools, public schools, universities are radicalizing these kids to Marxists mm-hmm. without them even knowing what's going on. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you see it in the culture today. You see this outrage mob. You see this crazy things going on today where people just want to be upset about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I, and also, I recently saw a picture on Twitter 
these parents, they're pro-abortion. They're dressing these kids up, these infant kids with onesies that say, thank God for abortion. <gasps> oh On the infant gosh. kids. They have these onesies that say, thank God for abortion. Oh and it's just mind-blowing to me that you could even think that when you have an infant there yeah. and say, thank God for abortion, I'm like, well, this life didn't just begin when they came out. Oh, gosh. But this is the kind of thing we're growing up in. These little kids that don't know what they're doing are learning about abortion thinking it's a good thing. And it makes me so thankful that my kids, that they get to grow up in a home where they're going to be showing us how to love Jesus. And it makes me thankful for all Christian parents that are teaching their kids to grow up and love, you know, love Jesus. But, but seeing Hezekiah, it reminds me that no matter who their parents are, God can get hold of anyone's heart. Amen. It doesn't matter what age, it doesn't matter male or female, it doesn't matter. God can get a hold of anyone's heart. I mean, I came from a, a family of unbelieving, not probably Catholic, but didn't really live like it. But I came from a family, and God got a hold of my heart. Um, so I want to go into the uh, obedience part of Hezekiah, because I want to break kind of those three things down. Because those are really the three things that stood out to me. Um, so Hezekiah knew that Assyria was coming to battle against Israel. He could have listened to the, the prophecies of Isaiah because Isaiah talks about, he prophesies that God's going to raise up Assyria as his rod of judgment against other nations. And so going into his reign, Hezekiah is knowing, well, they're coming around to us. They're going around everyone else, taking everyone else out, taking land, because God's raising them up as an instrument of judgment. And sure enough, they're going to come against us. And so he wanted to make sure they were ready for them to come. Uh, from previous battles, the walls uh, protection, their walls fortifying their cities had been damaged. There was holes in them, uh, and they never got repaired. So he went to go. He wanted to go repair those walls. He wanted to strengthen their walls. He wanted to strengthen protection. They even built an extra wall. Who knew that walls would work? Uh, <laughs> not a joke there. <laughs> uh, but but all joking aside, it, it, what thing that stood out to me reminded me of was. When we finish going through a hard time, when we finish going through a trial, a battle, it's not an invitation to take a vacation. That's right. I know after certain jobs, uh, I'm just like, man, I need some days off. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's just one, nothing to do with work, nothing to do with anything, it's just me mostly sleeping sometimes. <laughs> but as a Christian, when we get done going through a trial, through a battle, through something difficult, it's not an invitation to take time off from God. Um, mm -hmm. When we take a break, when we take a vacation, and just try to step back, we do two things. We leave ourselves open for another attack from the enemy mm -hmm. uh, without being prepared, and we get out of the fight. Mm -hmm. um, there will be times God asks us to step away from things, to take a step back, to let someone else take over for a while, or something in the matter, just, hey, just step out of this for a while. But he's never saying, stop taking a break from me. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I, want you, I may want you to step away from this, but I don't want you to step away from me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, so Hezekiah had the, the city fortify the walls, any holes in the wall, anything for the enemy to get an advantage to get in. He wanted to make sure there was nothing, that they knew exactly where the enemy was going to come from, that there was nothing to sneak in and get them. He wanted to protect his people, and he wanted to protect his nation. Um, and there was a water source that flowed through the city and went outside to the city. And he knew, hey, this water is going to come right here. The Syrians are going to come. The water is going to help them when they're thirsty. It's going to strengthen them when they need something to drink. And so he cut off that water to not give them any kind of advantage. It came at a cost to them to have the convenient time in the water where they had it, uh, but he cut it off to not give them any kind of advantage, not to give them any kind of help. And just because we can enjoy certain things doesn't mean it's beneficial for our walk with Christ. Um, Amen. It's, a, you know, it's the same thing in our lives as Christian. The enemy is always coming against us, and we cannot give him any life source. We can't give him anything in our life that says, hey, you can take a straw, you can take a foothold here. You could take a, you know, come at me from this way because I'm giving you something, because I'm giving you space to come in. We can't do that as Christians. Um, whether, and it can come in so many different avenues. It can be in our conversation what we have with others at home or at work. Um, the jokes we laugh at. I know I still have a hard time not laughing at certain jokes because they're certainly so funny to me. Um, but I have to really like remind myself that those things are not pleasing to God. I have to constantly just like, this is not pleasing to God. I may laugh and think it's funny sometimes, but I have to remember, this is not pleasing your God. Um, 
our responses to people when they insult us or ridicule us or come against us, how are we responding to them? Are we responding to them in, uh, in the way Jesus would? Um, or are we responding to them in the way our flesh would? I still struggle with that sometimes. Uh, the people we spend time with. I know it can be unavoidable depending on the situation, but I know when I'm with people, especially at work, who are cussing all the time. And it's, I mean, any, it's not just construction, it's any line of work. People are mm-hmm. always just... Psh, 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 psh. Mm-hmm. It's so hard for me not to spew out that language. And I was telling Philip, like, that, that can still sometimes be one of my biggest struggles. Because it's something I'm so used to, and Philip knows very well before I was saved. And so, when I'm around someone, especially one guy I used to work with, it's just like, it starts becoming like, it just wants to flow out. Um, and so, what are we doing to counteract that with? Because we're always going to, we can't get away from it. Unless you want to put yourself in a bubble, you're always going to be around people like that. Friends, family, you're always going to be people like that. So, what are we doing to counteract it? I know a lot of times I have to go and just like, God, I have to get away with you. I have to read. I have to listen to Christian music. It's like I have to like, I get all this nasty stuff and then I have to detox. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's skip too far. Uh, so that's something like we have to constantly do. And Proverbs 22, 24 to 25 says, Make no friendship with a man given to anger, mm-hmm. nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. And it's not something that's just anger. You spend enough time with people, mm-hmm. you're going to start picking up their habits. Mm-hmm. You're going to start adapting time to what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, we have to really be careful who we invest a lot of our time with. Just hanging out with, just having fun. You know, we have to really be careful who we do that with because we'll start picking up their habits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the music we listen to. I know there's something I say almost every single time I preach. What kind of music are we allowing into our lives? Is it music that's glorifying God? Is it music that's degrading God? Is it music that's degrading people? Is it music that's not even maybe anti-God, but it's not pulling us closer to God? What are we listening to? Mm-hmm. Um, the movies we watch. I mean, there's, there's so many movies out these days. I'm like, man, I probably would have thought that was hilarious back in the day. Or I remember this movie. Um, I mean, a lot of times Craig, you will send me a meme and I'll just blast them with the, like 10 memes back. <laughs> But a lot of them are like way old, not even dirty, but they're just like way old thing, movies I used to watch a long time ago, but just funny parts in it. But it's like that stuff, even when we think about it, when we joke about it, it's still, there's still that part where it just comes in and feeds our mind. Mm-hmm. Um, the TV we can watch, I mean, there's times we'll watch, we're at my parents' house, they for a week, and over and over we have, we're, there's, we're watching, we watch a lot of soccer and football there. Um, but over and over, we had to say, hey, close your eyes. I don't want you watching this commercial. You know, and the, the, the things on TV, like, they're just getting raunchier and raunchier. Mm-hmm. But I, when I tell Sammy to do that, I shouldn't be watching it either. Right. Because it's something that's still mm-hmm. feeding on me. And I, a lot of times I think Christians will be like, well, I'm old, so it's not that big of a deal. I'll see it, but I just put it out of my mind. Like, it's still mm-hmm. having an effect on us. Mm-hmm. Um, and even certain people who claim to be Christian, but... Will make you casual in, their, in your walk because they're casual in their walk. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not. They say, "Yeah, I'm a believer. I go to church. I read the Bible," but they're not doing anything to challenge you. To not push you to go forward. To not want, hey, let's go farther in Jesus together, in Christ together. Let's let's, let's do something. You know what I mean? And just be like, "Yeah, I'm a Christian," but hey, let's go do this real quick or whatever. It's like, who are we letting influence our lives? Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as Hezekiah took over, he made immediate change in Judah. Not because he thought it was a good idea, but because he wanted to follow the law of God. Amen. He had, he took Isaiah's advice. He took all those prophets, the prophecies he had, and he took heed of them. You know, he had doubt. He said, man, if this is what God's saying, if this is what the, the Torah is saying, what God spoke to Moses, this is what I want to follow. If this is what God wants, this is what I want to do. Um, he didn't push the words to the side. A lot of people were here preaching a, that, that's convicting and just Shove it aside. Um, I remember I was telling Shelly about this yesterday. Our second year at Summit, I was going through, I mean, you know this, and almost everyone else does. I was going through a really hard time where there was just that constant, just nagging. And I, I, I knew it wasn't God, but I would struggle so much with it. I would say, just end everything with Shelly. I don't want you to be with him. And it was just constant, constant. So first year at our chapel service, which we had five days a week, I sat in the second row every single day. Second year, I sat in the very back. Because for some reason, I thought, hey, if, if God says I'm convicting, I could just kind of, I'll be back here. It's kind of like a protection. 
But people will do that. Like on my spaces, like, and I met a lot of guys, like, hey, yeah, they said this, but I don't really care about that. They just push it away. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk to guys all the time at school. You know, this isn't right, and you shouldn't be doing this, and mm-hmm. just push it aside. God's disgrace, man. It's all good. Everyone's different. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. just push mm-hmm. it aside. And there's so many people that went to school that struggle with that. They're really struggling to walk with God. Or don't even have one anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that's like, I pray all the time, like, Lord, please, God, don't ever let me get casual in my walk. I can't, I can't even think of the, how it would feel. I mean, I wouldn't care at the time, I'm sure, because my heart would be hardened, but I don't ever want to be one of those people that start walking away from God. Mm-hmm. It just becomes casual with God. Right. Mm-hmm. And like Pastor Carter says, that he prays every day, Lord, help me finish well. Mm-hmm. Help me cross the finish line well. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get dragged across it, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I want to finish well. Mm-hmm. Um... And Hezekiah, that was his heart. His heart was to follow God. His heart was for his nation to follow God. Um, and he brought them, he brought everyone back to worship. Uh, so if you want to go to 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3. Um, Phil, you want to read? 29, verse 3 through 11. He in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and, uh, and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment and to hissing for shame as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and, and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. So this was powerful to me because it's like Hezekiah came there, looked at everything, saw everything in ruin, and saw the priests and the Levites still there, and said, What's going on here? That's right. Yeah. How is this acceptable to anyone? It is, I mean, and it's convicting to me because I'm sure there's people that time like, man, this should be fixed. This should, people, someone should do this, and someone should fix this. But Hezekiah was the one that said, man, this needs to be fixed. Let's do something Amen. about it. You know, and it's convicting to me because a lot of times I'll talk about stuff, but then I don't follow with action. You know, and I'm sure there was a lot of people like, man, we need to do something. Mm-hmm. And no one did anything. But Hezekiah came along and said, hey. You guys are supposed to be leading this place. You guys are supposed to be leading the people in worship. You guys are supposed to be taking care of this place. You're supposed to be offering the sacrifices. And you guys aren't doing your job. You're not doing what God has called you to do. And how often have we been in a place where, like, man, God's called me to do this, and I'm not doing it. I mean, there's so many times, like, I should be doing this, I should be doing this, and God's called me to do this, and I haven't done it. You know, and that's what Hezekiah's wake-up call with them. God has put you here for a purpose, and you're not doing it. This is your job, what you were set apart for, and you're not doing it. You guys need to fix this. Amen. Um, Hezekiah wanted to bring the people back to worship. He wanted the temple to function the way it was supposed to. He wanted it to be a place where we would come and do what God called them to do. He wanted, and this, the, make more sense of it, without a temple, they couldn't make the sacrifice. They couldn't ask for forgiveness. They needed a temple for that. He wanted to be there for the people who could be in right relationship with God. He was someone that was standing in the gap for them. You know, he was someone that was pleading for God to fix everything. Mm -hmm. And he was taking action. He wasn't just sitting there talking about it. He was taking action. Um, I'm going to read, sorry, I'm going to go from verse 20. And chapter 29 to chapter 31, verse 1. And Hezekiah the king rose early, gathered officials of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, seven male goats for a sin offering, 
for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and the Judah and for Judah, sorry. Um, and he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they slaughtered the bulls and the priests and received the blood and threw it against the altar. And they slaughtered the rams and the blood was thrown against the altar. And they slaughtered the lambs and their blood was thrown against the altar. Then the goats for the sin offering were brought to the king in the assembly and they laid their hands on them. And the priests slaughtered them and made a sin offering for the blood on the altar. They made atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offerings and the sin offerings should be made for all Israel. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, lyres. And according to the commandment of David, and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet, and the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David, the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also, and the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the, sing, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with them bowed themselves in worship. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded that the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises of gladness, and they bowed down in worship. Then Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank, thanks offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all who were of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. The number of burnt offerings um, sorry, I'm losing, that the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering for the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So up until other priests had consecrated themselves, the brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests and consecrated themselves. And besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings and burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people. And the thing came about suddenly. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come from the house, come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. Hezekiah had such a desire to restore mm-hmm. his country Amen. to proper worship uh, to, to God, and wanted the people to be ruled and honored by God. Mm-hmm. He was a king, but he wanted God to rule through him. Mm-hmm. Um, he wanted his nation to come back. And he, that's exactly what they did. They brought it back. Amen. They came back and did the necessary sacrifices. They came back and they opened it up. <clears throat> and they were filled with gladness. Our desire as believers should always be to invite people to come to proper worship of God. To right relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Especially other believers. We want to pull people back or off to come back to biblical Christianity. Amen. Mm-hmm. And it's something I see so often with Ryan. I don't have a Facebook anymore. But I know when I had a Facebook, every five minutes... There's another plus from Ryan. Get back to what you're doing. God called you for something else. And it's just constant, constant. But that's his hard desire, to have people in right relationship with God, to glorify God. Amen. I know every single time he gets a chance at work, he'll, he'll pray. You know, he talks about God all the time I work with people. And it's, it, this is what this reminds me of when Hezekiah is doing this. I'm like, man, this, was like, this is like Ryan every day in his life with everything he does. I'm not saying he's perfect. But, well, no, it's perfect. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but that's his heart, is to bring people to proper relationship with Christ. Um, now, when Hezekiah sent, he, so he sent couriers all over Israel, inviting everyone, come, come, we're, the temple's fixed, we're good to go, we're here to make sacrifices, come get right with God. Amen. He sent people all throughout the land to do this. Um, and he, a lot of these people were mocked and ridiculed. They came back and said, hey, come with us, come do this. And they were mocked and ridiculed. A lot of people just laughed at them, yelled at them, scorned them, whatever. Um, and whenever, and it's something that's like, whenever you want to live sold out for God, you will be mocked and ridiculed. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed. By uh, both unbelievers and believers. Yeah. Yeah. Leonard Ravenhill said, whenever someone wants to grow and get more mature with Christ, you're always going to have the spiritual doors point at you and say, oh, you think you're better than us, huh? Mm-hmm. You're always going to get ridiculed. It doesn't matter if it's by believers or unbelievers. You're going to be called too radical, too extreme. Mm-hmm. And 
Glenn Ravenhoff said, I don't think I'm going to get to heaven. And God's going to say, you were too extreme for me. You know, he's never going to get to us. And like, you should have been less extreme, man. You should have been a little bit more casual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's never going to be something God's never going to say to us. Um, I don't think we could ever be, True. I don't think we could ever love Jesus enough. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he, the one thing that all this leads to, the obedience, the worship, it leads to complete surrender. It leads to complete surrender to God because you're in this right relationship with Him. You know the character of God. And it's easy to surrender to God when you know His character. Um, now, Assyria was coming. The, the attack was coming now. Assyria was coming to attack Judah. In Assyria um, was the nation that God had risen up, like I said, to be a total judgment to other nations, which Isaiah talks about in his book. All right, I, there's a lot of scripture we're going to read. We're going to read two chapters. Mm-hmm. So who's a good reader? Carrie, you want to read? Yeah, which chapter? Second Kings 18 and 19. Oh, isn't that where we've been? I'm sorry, I'm 14. Psalms 119. <laughs> <laughs> King, second Kings what, 18? 18. If I want you to stop after verse 17. I'll just cut you off and I'll just stop. Okay, second Kings 18? Yeah, and 19. Okay, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Ap- Debbie, do you have reading glasses? I can read I'm sorry. <laughs> All of a sudden I was like, I mine are lost. I can't find them. I need to get some uh, Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, and brake the images, mm-hmm. and cut down the groves, and brake in pieces the brazen servant that Moses had made. For unto the days of the children of Israel, the burnt, uh, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, a son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is, in the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel. Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria, and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and would not hear them, <coughs> nor do them. Okay, hold on. <coughs> so, real quick... <coughs> Because sometimes they can get confusing about Israel and Judah. This is a part when the kingdom was divided. Um, Judah was the southern kingdom, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and Israel was considered the northern kingdom. So when it talks about Israel, Israel actually carried away. It didn't exactly mean a nation of Judah. So just mm-hmm. um, throw it out there. Keep going. Oh, what verse? Uh, 13. Okay, now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, Lachish, saying, I have offended, return from me, and and which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and thirty talents of gold. And Hezekiah came and gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid 
and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris uh, and Rabshaki from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. Okay. And Sorry. <clears throat> All right. So now you're like, what in the world happened to Hezekiah? You know, the Bible talks about so good. What is up with this? He stripped the house of the Lord after he fixed it and gave it to the king of Assyria. Now, when you go back up, uh, verse 10 is talking about Assyria is going and it's taking ground. You know, it's going and it's taking these other cities. It just took the Israelites away. You know, these are people that God called his to, and they just took them away. So now I'm sure in Hezekiah's head, he's like, oh my gosh, they just took them away. What's going to happen to us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so often that we can see. We can see the pressure mounting with the movement for anti-God that we can start worrying like, oh my gosh, what's, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to me? All this is going to come against me. There are things going to happen with jobs. I mean, you see how everyone's just getting so politically correct and anything against that. In the workplace, people are getting fired. People are getting removed from jobs. I mean, people, people I mean, the left will eat their own. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's the truth. Um... Pete Buttigieg, who's a, who's a Democratic guy running for president, who's homosexual, claims to be Christian, uh, which is really bizarre to me. Um, but he's part of the left, right? He's part of this, but there's a picture that came up with him working with the Salvation Army two years ago. And the left just <laughs> tries to eat him now because it's right. something that's against them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even with Chick-fil-A, when they, they bent the knee and said, we're not going to be donating to Christian companies anymore. They come out right and said that, but they said we're going to donate to people to help with homelessness, education, and housing? No, not housing. I forget what it was, but it was the same thing that Salvation Army did that they did. Yep. That they donated to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they said we want to, basically what they were saying is, hey, we want to be accepted by the left. Mm -hmm. We want to be accepted by everyone. <clears throat> and they get given to that pressure. When you go back and look at the records from a few years ago, 2017, they donated to the Southern Poverty Law Center, who is an extremely liberal company, who goes out and labels all these churches hate groups, Christian organization hate groups. Um, and so you see, you see, oh man, they were feeling the pressure, and something happened. I mean, the guy's the president now, donated to Obama and Hillary Clinton, um, and he's the one running Chick fil A now. Uh, but they gave into that pressure, they gave in and say, okay, okay, you know, we'll, we'll give you guys what you want. Um, and this example, what you're going to see right here, we'll, we'll give you guys what you want. We'll bend the knee to you. We'll give money to you. Mm -hmm. We'll do this. Instead of giving this scripture, we'll give it to you now. Uh, and they've been donating to companies that had ties with Planned Parenthood. Um, oh. But here's the thing, that the LGBT, whatever, came out and said, that's not good enough. Right. We want more. We want more. That's yeah. not good. You guys, yeah, sure, you made a small step, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's going on here. Hezekiah went out of the fear and gave everything mm -hmm. that he could to Assyria to try to keep them off. Mm -hmm. so I gotta protect my people. Are they gonna kill us? They're gonna mm -hmm. take our. They're gonna take everyone. I'm sure going through this. I'm gonna look foolish because mm -hmm. I said nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. Nothing's gonna happen. We're gonna be protected. Um, and he gave them everything, but Assyria said, "We don't care. We'll take it." But we're still coming to get you yeah. guys. We're still coming to take yeah. over. And it's something so often people can do with the enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we say, okay, just, just take, like not in the, in the sense where we're talking to the devil saying, hey, just take this and leave me alone. We're saying, well, maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe I'll give it in a little bit in this area. I'll go along with this. I'll go along with that. Um, and we'll just be cool. Everyone, I won't get hated by people. People won't be screaming at me. People won't call me a bigot. People won't think I'm crazy. Um, but, if, you know, we give a little ground devil. He's not going to just, okay. That's cool. He wants it all. You know, it's not just... The, the mistake we make is when we give the enemy ground. Mm -hmm. We're saying, right. you know what, this, this might not be okay to the world, and I don't want them to hate me, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to back off here. You know, I'm not going to say this. It's too controversial. I'm not going to say this. But that's exactly what the enemy always wants. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Assyria was doing as Kai, they probably said, hey, give us this, you know, and we won't kill you. Give, we're going to kill you anyway. Mm -hmm. You fell for our trick. Mm -hmm. um, and so Hezekiah had a last in judgment. He gave him the fear and listened to the demands of the enemy in hopes of mercy from the enemy. Um, and I feel like there's so many people unknowingly don't want to deal with the struggle 
of you know speaking out, of being considered a hardcore Christian, not just a Christian, not a biblical Christian, but a hardcore Christian, um, and don't want to deal with that and just settle for being an ordinary believer and doing just enough to get to heaven. They want to be one of those things. Say, hey, I love God, but I'm not going to take down these idol worship because that could be too controversial in my time. And I'm sure that's what a lot of the kings did. I don't want to be too controversial. I don't want to cause an uproar. I don't want issues. I love God. I'm going to tell people I love God. I keep loving God. And I'll be pleasing God's sight. But I'm not going to take down all the stuff. I'm not going to speak out against this. I'm not going to take action against the stuff that's not honoring God. Um, but there's an issue. And that's what happened with this guy. He gave ground to the enemy. Uh, he stripped God what was rightfully his and gave it to the enemy. The man who dared to defy God. When we give in to this culture, to the world, we're giving the devil what rightfully belongs to God. When we get threatened to act the status quo from friends, work, we cannot give in. God has given us all a mandate to stand and fight. But we need to always be ready to do that. We're given, when we give in, you give your fear to, to the enemy. Mm-hmm. Our only fear should be to fear God. Amen. You know, we take that away from God and say, we don't fear you as much as we fear the mm-hmm. enemy. Mm-hmm. And that's an issue so many people have. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, Carrie, I need you to keep reading uh, right where you left off. I think you left off at, and they went up to Jerusalem in great numbers. You can start at 17 again. Okay. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rebsar- and Rebsaris. You can skip the names. <laughs> Another hard <laughs> No, I actually, yeah. Um, uh, no, I'll just keep reading. And, okay. and Rebshaki from Lachish and King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And Rabsheki said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest that they are, thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which, if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust in him. But if you say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God, is not that he, whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away, and has said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be able, on thy part, to set riders upon them. How then will thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? <clears throat> Am I now come up without the lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, and Rabshaki, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servant in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshaki said unto them, Have my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Has he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rebshake stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Assyria, for thus saith the king of Assyria, uh, excuse me, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, 
And then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of, full, of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. All right, real quick. So here, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I am know it's 12. We're going to try to hurry it, but I want to make sure we read all the scripture. I know it's a lot, but it's so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, real quick right here, when he says, he wants to give you all these things if you just surrender so that you may live and not die. That's a command of God of us, the uh, enemy in the garden. You mm -hmm. know, it's a command of us. is eat of him so that we may live and not die. And here, the, and the enemy's here taking it for himself. Mm -hmm. Because it's just a flesh and he's speaking to the flesh mm -hmm. and saying, here, surrender to me. What's the point of dying? Yeah. I'll take care of you. <laughs> and it's always just a flesh. Same thing he did to Hezekiah when he's saying, give me everything, I won't attack you. Then he gives him everything and he still attacks him. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, okay. I didn't yeah, mean to no, cut no. you off. I just wanted to... And they, he was offering them what they already had. Right. Um, so that you may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuaded you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of, out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sevarvam, Hema, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people held their peace mm -hmm. and answered him not a word, mm -hmm. for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Mm -hmm. Then came Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joab the son of Asaph, and the recorder of Hezekiah, with their clothes rent, and said, with their clothes rent, and, and told him the words of Repsheki. Okay, well, okay. Now this is one thing. Hezekiah, the people did really good on this. He said, mm -hmm. keep your mouth shut. <laughs> don't respond to anything they're going to say. Because he knew what they were going to say. He knew they were going to come threatening. He said, don't respond. And that's something I feel like God's always telling us. Don't respond to the enemy. Don't even, don't even mm -hmm. have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Ignore them. Let them say what he wants to say. Mm -hmm. He's saying it to me anyway, to, to God. Just ignore them. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, Ryan, will you read the next chapter? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, verse 1. Yours are strong. What, uh, Kings? Chapter, yeah, 2 Kings 19. And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth and Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos and they said unto him thus says Hezekiah this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring them forth it may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God has heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. Mm. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the works which thou hast heard, which, with which did servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and it shall return to his own land, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rab Shekha returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And when he heard say of Tirhaka, the king of Ethiopia, Behold, he has come out to fight against thee. He sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not God, in whom thou trust, deceive you, saying, 
Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hands of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shall thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden, which were in Thelasar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpah and the kings of the city of Sir Favahim and he, Hina and Ivan, Iva and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it and Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said O Lord God of Israel which dwell between the cherubim Thou art God, even thou alone, and all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thy ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the, the living God. <clears throat> of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and they have cast their gods into the fire. For there were no gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, O God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. All right, hold on right there. Now when you read that last section, it's that is pure surrender from Hezekiah. He's going out and saying, Lord, this is what they said about you. This is what they said they're going to do to us. God, please, I need you to move. Amen. And this is something, if you probably would remember, what, if he would remember what Isaiah said, like God is, he raised them up to be an instrument. These guys are taking glory for themselves because they think they're going around, but God raised them up. You know, God raised them up to be a hand of judgment. So Isaiah is saying, God, we're toast. I got nothing. I mean, I remember when we lived in Alabama, and we're living on like $12 an hour, um, just me, uh, with Sammy. There's times like we have bills, and I'm like, Lord, I got nothing. <laughs> Amen. But, and there's, it's just surrender. It's just saying, God, this is, this is my situation. It's good for us to come to God and be like, God, this is what's going on. I have no control of this. I need you to take over, Lord. Um, right, I'll, I'll finish that real quick. Yeah. Okay, verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, said to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have mocked the Lord. And you have said, With my many chariots I have gone to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. And I felled, I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses, and I entered its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. I dried up with the sole, I dried up with the sole of my foot, all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what I now bring to pass. That you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, and are dismayed and confounded. And they become like plants of the field, and like, ten and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it is grown. But I know you're sitting down, and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me, because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come to my ears. I will put my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And this shall be the sign for you, the year, uh, this year, eat what grows from itself, and the second year, what springs from the same. In the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward Amen. and bear fruit upward. Amen. Believers don't just bear fruit by following the ways of the wisdom of the world. That's right. We don't just get self up and say, we're going to bear all this fruit for God. We don't get a, eight steps to this or eight steps to that. That's right. We bear fruit by going deep with God. Right. Not just a shallow knowledge of God, but a deep, intimate walk with God. Amen. It doesn't say that we blossom... We show all these great things, and then we go deep with God. That's right. Um, 
we have to go down to the dirt for the dirt to fortify this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see trees, I hate trees because if you plant them next to a driveway, they could destroy the driveway. Mm -hmm. You know, the roots would just go and just get so strong and it'll destroy it. And but when you want to kill a weed, you take it out at the root. Mm -hmm. But when we grow down, we keep going down with God, we get stronger and stronger and stronger. And while people think everything above ground is strong, it's, it's really what's below. Mm -hmm. You know, it's our foundation with the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, verse 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of the Mount of Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Syria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield or cast a siege mm -hmm. mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. And he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it, for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. In that night the angel of the Lord went out and <coughs> struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, there were dead bodies everywhere. The Sennacherib, the, then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in, in Nineveh. And as he was worshipping the house of Nishrach, his god, Adramelech and Sherazar, his son, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. Um, and Eshadad and his son reigned in this place. Now, this is God saying, he's not going to do nothing. Because I don't know, this is my city. These are my people that are following me or seeking me. And he will not win. I will take care of this. And I mean, I was talking to Phil. I'm like, how crazy to think that 185,000 people in like one night were just slaughtered. Like, that's a lot of people. I mean, imagine being one person and you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, everyone around me is dead. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just, that's a crazy thing, but Israel Amen. didn't have to do nothing. Amen. Complete surrender from Hezekiah and they had to do nothing. They just surrendered to God and said, God, you have to take care of this because I have nothing. And God took care of it. Amen. Because ultimately, when enemies attacking you, he's attacking God. Mm -hmm. right. He's coming against God. And God's always going to defend his name. Right? Amen. Um, now, Hezekiah, one, some of the things that stood out to me, and I'll finish up here, sorry to go over on you guys. Um, Hezekiah had re fortified the city, brought the temple back to proper order, destroyed the false god of worship, and got Judah back on track with God. But he still, after doing all that, he still did not trust in his own strength. You know, he didn't say, well, they're coming against me, I've done all this, I'm going to take care of it. You know, this is no big deal for me, I've done all this other stuff. He was completely surrendered to God, knowing, to God, knowing that unless God did something, then they would get crushed. And unless God fought for them, they didn't stand a chance. Hezekiah had to remind his people not to say anything to their enemy. Um, and when the enemy comes with accusation, when the enemy comes at us with accusations, we don't need to respond. We're saying, God, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm getting accused with. I mean, how often do uh, you guys feel in your hearts and your minds that you're not good enough? That you're not a good enough Christian? You're not doing enough? You know, it's constantly just a bombardment in our minds that we're not good enough for God. I know I deal with it all the time. And those are always accusations from the enemy. You know, God, if, we're, if something's wrong, God's going to come and he's going to be gentle about it. Mm -hmm. You know, God's going to come and say, hey, there's going to be an encouragement. It's not mm -hmm. a condemnation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, so that's how we can tell the difference. And we say, God, this is how I'm feeling. Lord, if there's something in my life that's not pleasing you, show me. Mm -hmm. But I need to get rid of these accusations because it's always going to bog you down. It's always going to hold you down. Um, and what I want... <clears throat> One th what I want to get at with Hezekiah was he knows he knew that the battle belonged to God mm -hmm. um, he did but but he did everything not to give the enemy an inch of advantage mm -hmm. um, to not give him a chance to get a foothold at all in his life and as believers that should always be on our goal in life to fortify the walls in our life to fortify the walls in our heart mm -hmm. if there's anything in our life that's not pleasing to God we gotta say God I need you to help me get this out of my life because this isn't pleasing to you we can't give the enemy a foothold in any part of our life. In any part. Um, we have to protect it. We can't give any life source to the enemy. Amen. Second Timothy 1.14 says, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. We have to guard this life with all that we have. Mm -hmm. The kings that were sold out to God did great exploits in their lifetime. They really wanted to see God move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to see God move in my life. Mm -hmm. I want to see miraculous things happen. You know, I don't want to and get to the end of my life and be like, God, I just, you know, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't go all the way with you. I was 95% of there. I don't want my life to ever be the one who was pleasing in God's sight, but he didn't take down all the things, right? You know? Mm -hmm. Amen. I want to be like Hezekiah said. Yes, he messed up, but
but it's God's mercy that brought him back. Amen. And yes, we mess Amen. up, but God's mercy Amen. brings us back. Amen. But we have to constantly be on the watch out to guard our hearts, guard our lives, guard our minds, guard our relationship with God, because it's the most precious thing we have. Amen. Amen. Um, 